Good morning. It's time for another morning Bible study with your host, Logan McCulley. That's me. Today, we're going to get into Luke 17. I'm sorry for the weird intro, guys. I was just trying it out. Let me know how you feel about that. I don't have a set standard for this yet, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I hope y'all are enjoying the episodes of us going in-depth, moderately in-depth on each chapter of the Bible, and we can steadily work our way through the Bible this way. Just let me know. Like, drop me a comment. Leave me something that lets me know, hey, yo, it's good. It's bad. I wish you would do X, Y, Z. I like it when you do this. I don't like it when you do that. You know, just some good, honest feedback is all I'm looking for. Nothing too mean, but some good feedback. It would be much appreciated for me. And that's that's really it. So I guess we're going to go ahead and get into Luke 17. Now, Luke 17 is really cool to me because there's some things in here that you hear a lot. This is where the mustard seed comes from. This is where... Uh, that whole verse about tying a stone around your neck. that Those two things, the leper, lepers get cleansed here. There's some things that happen in this chapter that stick out in your mind, or at least in my mind, when I think about some of the old Bible stories, specifically the millstone and the mustard seed. Let's get started in verse 1. Then he said to the disciples, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through, through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea that he should offend one of these little ones. That's that stone tied around your neck, get thrown in the sea to die. And a violent death as well. Verse 3, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. That opening statement holds a lot of weight and holds a lot of weight in my life as well, okay? All of our lives, I think. I mean, what part of the Bible doesn't hold weight? But let's just stick to what we got here. Let's start with the first one. It is impossible that no offense should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. This is verse 2. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and if he were thrown into the sea, then he should offend one of these little ones. Now, think about that. The little ones that were around Jesus were listening to Jesus and loving Jesus and were supposed to go to Jesus like a child would. If we, as an adult, offend one of those little ones where they move away from the church for a stupid, silly reason that isn't biblically based, we, I mean, it's pretty clear in what it says would be better. It would be better for you if you were to have a rock tied around your neck and thrown into the ocean, which is a violent death. So I think about that, and I think about situations that I might have been in the past where you have these jerk reactions just from, like, your culture, right? So, like, you may or may not agree with me this, but, like, tattoos on the face. Why we got tattoos on the face, man? Ain't no reason for tattoos on the face. Would you want your doctor to have tattoos on his face? I don't know. That's that's a personal decision. However, if you turn away from, turn someone away from Christ because of your feelings about someone that has tattoos on their face, you know what happens. You know what Jesus Jesus has said about you in that situation. So I try to think about those situations or like types of music. I was at a Sunday school class one time when they were trying to say, and I I, I say this loosely, but they were trying to communicate that there's certain types of music that represent devilish things. And I was like, interesting. Are you saying the words? Because yes, there is like devil worship music and there is very explicit pagan songs that just entice you to do things that you shouldn't do, right? They're out there. However, are you saying that the beats are inherently bad? The beat of the music, the whatever it is. And they're like, oh, well, you know, the, the beats carry some weight. I was like, come on. So, and that specific Sunday, I had someone in class that was new to the church. And I was like, don't, don't, don't listen too hard to what they're saying. They're like, that's not how everyone believes. I don't know where this is coming from. Stay with me. We're good. Okay. I don't remember saying anywhere in the Bible where a certain type of music, a certain beat of music is like Satan, 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 without saying that. So... What are those things that we can identify as turning away people from Christ for silly reasons that aren't biblically based whatsoever? 
This is kind of the rabbit hole I go down in my head. Then it says, Take heed to yourselves, this is verse 3, If your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. Now this is pretty straightforward. The word rebuke, though, there's a definition in here, but I want to give it to you the Logan way. Basically, when I, when I see how they define rebuke, that to me says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. That means if you see your brother mess up, you straighten his butt out. You don't let him slide on that because that's how you get into that backsliding stuff. You got to let him know what's up per Bible. What's up per God. And then if they choose to do whatever they want to do, that's their choice, right? You can't make someone follow the rules. You can't make someone be a good person. But your job is to straighten their butt out. And then, if they come back and they repent, you forgive him. That's our role. That's what we're told to do. And that forgiveness is a hard thing to do, buddy. That's a hard thing to do, especially for me. If someone actually wrongs me, I'm going to be real. I have a hard time just legitimately forgiving. Like, deep down in my soul, not even, like, holding a grudge or not even, like, that level of distrust if someone really messes you up. It's hard to let that go from me because I, I can forgive, but I can't forget sometimes. And I think forgetting is a part of that. You don't want to be taken advantage of, but you got to you gotta give people their due chance. And it says it literally right here. And it says, even if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day, he returns and says, I repent, you shall forgive him. These are the words from Jesus. I'm sure there's some examples out there that you can think of in your life where someone has for lack of a better word, screwed you over. And it took a long time. Even if they come back and they apologize, you're like, well, I don't, I mean, you made that mistake once, you're likely to make it again. But clearly, I have to forgive them. Clearly, I have to forgive these people. Which again, is something that I am personally working on. Because I've always said I'm a pretty awful person. This is how I'm trying to get better. I'm pretty, pretty clear and straightforward on that, that I suck as a human. All well, humans suck, really, but I, I especially know how bad I suck. And I'm trying to work on that. Moving to verse 5. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you, having, having a servant, plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field... Come in at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk? This is what you're saying to your servant. And afterward, you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that he was commanded of him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Now that's the next little section there in uh, 17. That's verse 5 down to 10. At the beginning, let's start there. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So you hear the first statement of 17 talking about what to do with the children, to not offend them, and then to forgive these people that sin against you. Like, sin against you. If they repent, forgive them. There, the apostles then turn to the Lord and say, Give me more faith. And honestly, honestly, I do ask that for a lot in prayer. I really do. For the more faith to work on me through the Holy Spirit, to really just help me with like my knee-jerk reactions. Like I would rather my knee-jerk reactions be better. Because my knee-jerk reactions aren't always the best. Like, I, don't know, like, I, I mean, if, so, if I, there's an issue at work and someone kind of bows up at me, my knee-jerk reaction is to bow up and put them back in their place. Is that what I should I should I do? Probably not. Like no, no, that should not be my knee-jerk reaction. There should be some compassion in there, some understanding. That's not what I do, and that's something that I'm working on. I ask for that faith, that ask for that help, in prayer. And that's what they just said. That's what they just did. Then the Lord turned to them and said, "If you have the faith of a mustard seed, and this is also calling me out, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you." Now, boom, that ends that kind of little section right there, and it would obey you. The faith of the mustard seed. My wife wears a, or Jennifer wears a necklace with a little mustard seed in it. Kind of the, like always reminder, like the faith of a mustard seed. That's all you need, the faith of a mustard seed. I need to get me like a mustard seed ring or something. I think that'd be cool. 
Then we move into, And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and sit down to eat. Now hold, what did he just say? He said, Your servant is out there working hard in the field. And after they work a full day's work, when they get done doing their job, are you going to ask them, come in at once and sit and eat. Let me serve you. No, you're not. Because that's their job. That's their duty. That's their role, right? You don't get thanked for doing your job. You get thanked for doing more than your job, maybe. But you don't get thanked for doing your job. Now, this is Jesus continuing on. He continues to say, but will he not rather say to him, talking about what's he going to say to a servant, prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. Now, what did he say there? Make me dinner. You worked all day, now you make me dinner, and gird yourself. That gird yourself is so interesting. I'm glad I know this. When they say gird yourself, that means make yourself ready. Gird your loins means like literally roll your robe up into like being able to have more movement in your legs. So there's nothing going on down there to tangle you up. Get ready, get prepared for something. Gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and then afterward you can eat and drink. Does the master thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I think not. That's the word of Jesus right there. I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. After we do the Lord's work, we are not to be like, oh, where's our reward? This kind of goes back to that dude who was upset for uh, accepting the prodigal son because he was working in expectation of something. Jesus is literally saying right now that we are to not be that guy. And when we get done with our job, say, thank you. Thank you. We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Verbatim. That is how we are supposed to respond to us doing our jobs. Man, 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 does that not cut deep? Man, does that not cut deep? Especially when you work in these jobs and you feel like you're underpaid and underappreciated. Of course you're underappreciated. What are we supposed to say? We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. Mm. Makes me feel a little bit better about all the people that I invite to church that don't come. I mean, I don't have like a reason why it doesn't make me feel better, but it does. It's like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Even if they're not responding, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Invite them to church, share the gospel, try to get them involved. That's my goal. All right, verse 11, now moving down there. Now what happened as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Now this is important because it's a roundabout walking path. And that's important to someone that's like, where was Jesus? And how does this relate to other books of the Bible? It's not that important to me, I'm going to be honest. Verse 12 then goes, says, Then as he entered a certain village, there he met ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. They're lepers and they're standing afar off because they are lepers. They are ceremonially unclean. They cannot come into the city. Everyone knows that they're a leper. That's why they have to stand that far away. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. As you would from a distance, right? You're screaming it, you're yelling it, you're saying, Hey, yo, bro, help me. That's what you're saying. And you're recognizing that it's Jesus. So when he saw them, this is verse 14, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was that they went, they were cleansed. Jesus from a distance, this is, this is again one of them things. How much faith do you have? If you have enough faith, it's going to happen, right? So at a distance, they said, Hey, help us. I know you can help us. And that's what Jesus did. He, did, they did. he didn't make him go do anything. He didn't uh, make him come to him. He didn't touch him. He just said, hey, you recognize, game recognizes game here. You recognize what I am. Go. Go show them to yourself. Or go show them yourself that you have been cleansed. Next, verse 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, was healed, returned, and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Why is that important? Because a Samaritan is not a Jew. Who did Jesus come back first for the Jews, then for the Gentiles? This person's a Gentile. That means the other ten people, or the other nine people, because there's ten total, were Jews. 
So you got nine Jews, one Gentile, that Jews are supposed to recognize and be able to glorify God. They're supposed, they, they know, you know better. But they didn't come back and glorify God. The Samaritan did. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Foreigner. Foreigner. And he said to him, Arise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. I read that and I couldn't find any reference. I hear that and I go, man. So like, the other nine had to have the faith to get cleansed, right? Maybe, I don't know. So he says that, arise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Does that mean the other nine that did go get cleansed and show themselves to the priests who didn't glorify God get leprosy again? I don't know. I don't know. That might be that might be one of them questions that I have for God when I get to heaven because I don't see it in the reference stuff. But it, but the way they say it, it makes a good question. What happened to the other nine? Did anything happen to them? Interesting. Verse 20. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Ooh, man. See, you know, Jesus drops bombs all the time. Because the Pharisees asked him straight up, when would the kingdom of God come? And you look into, like, what's the setting? How, why were they asking that? And they were asking it in a more... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Mockingly? Because they already concluded he was not the Messiah. So, obviously, he won't know. Right? But then Jesus turns around and calls them again out for their issues. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. You can't see it. You can't see the kingdom of God. You can't, because he says, you can't say see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. That's why, like, so like Jesus died on the cross for our salvation. And this is like one of those moments where you go, okay, he died on the cross for our salvation. The kingdom's already here. Yes, Jesus is going to come back for you, but Jesus already came. Because we're not living on the Old Testament. We're living under what Jesus did for us. So the kingdom's here. We need to be, I mean celebrating that Jesus did what he did for us. We don't have to pray through sacrifices. We don't have to go to a priest. We can directly pray to God. Those are big things. And I see stuff like that, and I go, this is why the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is within you. When you know, you know. And now, you know. Verse 22. Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of these days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. Oh, so he's already warning them. There's going to come a day where I'm going to be gone. And you're going to want me back. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under the heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Mm, he's talking about himself again. He's got to suffer all that stuff and then be killed. And as it was in the day of Noah, so it will be in the days also the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. We all know the story about Noah. He was the only, I don't know if I'd say holy man, but person that was living God's will. God flooded the earth, killed everybody. It wasn't good for everybody else. And that's what's happening today in this or the Son of Man's time. All these people were breaking the laws of God. And you know what happened to Noah. So then he backs it up with a second example of what happens when you're not living under God. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. Lot. Hmm, that sounds familiar. Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot left. Something happened to his wife. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, where, what's the, what's, the, what's the technical biblical term for what they were doing there? Sodomy. Sodomy. 
They're doing sodomy there, but on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from the heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, okay, so let's, I guess, is that the end of what they're talking about? Lot? Yeah, okay, so Lot also, at that time, if you think back, what happened to his wife? I thought they mentioned it here. They don't mention it here. But when they're leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, so Sodom, he's leaving Sodom, he's running away. What did the angels tell him? They told him, don't look back at Sodom. Don't look back. Whatever you do, don't look back. He got one rule. His wife looked back and it turned to a pillar of salt and died. Died and became a pillar of salt, however you want to look at that. That's a good representation of, like, we should not look back to our sins. We should not look back to where we came from. We need to look to God, look to Jesus. So moving on with what Jesus is saying in this setting. Verse 31. In that day, he who is also on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. All right, so I had to look this into this. Why is that important? Who's on the housetop? What he's saying, back in those days, a lot of these houses had a roof that was flat with an outdoor staircase. He's saying, you need to come so quickly that you don't even come down the staircase and go into your house and then leave. You just come down the staircase and keep rolling. There is no pass go collect $200. It's just go, 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 go. Uh, the person who's in the field... Again, not turn back. Don't go back for your tools. Keep going. Remember Lot's wife. Oh, it does talk about Lot's wife. Okay, this is verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night there will be two men, one in bed, and one will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? So he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Mm. 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 So what just happened there? He's talking about when we all get called to heaven, whenever the rapture is, whenever that happens, he's giving an example of six different people. People in bed, people in the field, people working in the kitchen. It all has to happen at one time. And this is one of those things that backs up why the Bible is also scientifically accurate. Because it shows that these six people all are going to get called at the same time. So how in the world are people going to be asleep and also working in the field and also cooking? Because the world is round. We know that on one side it's light, one side it's dark. They didn't know that the way we know that now. But yet, here it is in print, in the Bible, that shows a good representation of how accurate the Bible is. There is no flat earth. We know that. And here it's showing that we know that when we all get taken at one time, some people will be asleep, some people work in the field, some people will be cooking. And then the flip side of that is you're going to have two people doing each thing and only one is taken. The narrow path. It's, 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 it's hard to get in heaven. I wish, I wish more people would see it. I don't know how to get that out there. But that's not what we're talking about now. He said to them, where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Interesting. So I'm just going to read to you verbatim what they're talking about by the eagles and the lightning, that visual, rep visual representation of what we just read. The location of the carcass is visible from a great distance because of the circling carrion birds overhead. Similarly, Christ's return will be clearly evident to all near and far. The same point is made by the lightning in verse, verse 27, and this where it's coming from. The eagle carcass imagery here also speaks of the judgment that will accompany his return. That's a cool thought, that you can see it in the distance. Even if you're not a believer, you know it's happening. That it's such a thing that, like, it may not be happening right here, but you know it's happening over there, or over there, or over there. I mean, it's just, it's, it's interesting how they break that out. That's Luke 17. I hope you liked it. If you did... Drop me a rating, review, comment, subscribe to the channel. Make sure you don't miss an episode. I'm going to do these every, twice every week is my goal. Just let me know what you think, guys. Don't miss out. Read your Bible. Always keep your corn on the cob. I'm out.